Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, I have a, a twofold question or comment uh, for John. Uh, first, about the solid rocket boosters, uh, Russia versus United States mm -hmm. programs as far as launching power. And uh, it seems to me that I've seen some clips and file clips. And they use the series, especially the man the Okay, I'm sorry, caller. We're going to have to interrupt. We're going to join the uh, hearing that's just about to begin on toxic substances. Congressman Mike Sinar is in the chair. Thanks again, John Holmes. Let's go to the hearing. There is no question that in the 20th century that we enjoy better living through chemistry. Many of the conveniences of modern day life that we take for granted are possible only because of chemicals. But there is a dark side to the benefits we derive from the chemical society. Cancer and birth defects are caused by exposure uh, to certain chemicals. Groundwater and other water resources are contaminated by their improper disposal. And increasingly, it seems we hear reports of chemical truck accidents endangering entire neighborhoods with toxic fumes. Now, in an effort to have a safer chemical society, Congress enacted TSCA in 1976. John Quarles, who was then the Deputy Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, testifying for the administration explained the need for the law as follows, quote, existing federal laws fail to deal evenly and comprehensively with the toxic substances problems. Most existing laws are designed to prevent harmful exposure only after the substance if substances have been introduced into production. The two chief weaknesses in our approach today are first, that we do not have effective authority to impose controls on the chemicals and second, that we do not require adequate testing of them early enough to discover what sorts of problems may be posed by the chemicals. The law gave the EPA broad authority to require manufacturers to test existing chemicals, to screen new chemicals and regulate their introduction into commerce, to control unreasonable risk of chemicals as they become known, and to gather and disseminate information about chemical production use and possible adverse effects to human health and the environment. Now the act gives EPA many options for regulation of chemicals. They range from prohibition of their manufacture to certain uses in labeling and notification to consumers uh, concerning their risk. Now expectations of the law were high when it was first enacted. President Ford said, and I quote, it may be one of the most important pieces of environmental legislation that has been enacted by Congress, unquote. At the same time, news reports described it as a, quote, stringent bill that could lessen the, lessen the dangers of further chemical contamination of the environment. Now, when measured in terms of output of tests and regulatory rules, however, it appears that Tosca has been an underachiever. Most of EPA's regulatory and enforcement activities under the statute involve the two substances singled out by Congress for special legislative treatment, PCBs and asbestos. Now, why has EPA taken so few actions under the Act? Has, he be, has EPA made the right decisions not to regulate under the statute? Are there problems with the statute or with the way the law is administered? Is it both? Is it the lack of regulatory will? Has EPA devoted adequate resources to the implementation of the statute? And how good is the science that EPA is using? We hope to obtain answers to these and other important questions over the next several months, beginning with today's hearing. Our fundamental goal is to learn whether or not the expectations underlying the enactment of TSCA are being met. If not, we want to know what needs to be changed so that the American public will be confident that we are not guinea pigs for modern chemistry. Now, our first panel this morning will consist of the Chemical Manufacturers Association, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers. We'd ask at this time that Mr. Ronald J. Uh, Mr. J. Ronald uh, Condre uh, of the CMA come forward, Ms. Jackie Warren of the Natural Resources Defense Council, Mr. Eric Fruman, uh, the Health and Safety Director of the Amalgamated uh, Clothing and Textile Workers, and Karen uh, uh, Florini of the Environmental Defense Fund all come forward. Do 
All of you all are aware that in this subcommittee, in order not to prejudice past or future witnesses, we swear all witnesses in. Do any of you have any objections to being sworn in? If not, if you'd stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. First of all, I want to uh, thank you, Ms. Warren, uh, for coming. I know that uh, your mother recently uh, had a heart attack, and we want to wish her very well, and I know this has been somewhat of an inconvenience for you to come forward. I also want to thank uh, the Chemical uh, uh, Manufacturers Association for being here. We had invited the Chemical Specialty Manufacturers uh, also, but uh, they uh, chose not to come. So, Mr. Conray, you're going to be carrying uh, the weight of representing the industry upon a lot of uh, your shoulders today. Why don't we start uh, this morning uh, with you, Mr. Conray. We look forward to your testimony. For all four witnesses, your entire testimony will be made part of the record, and we'd ask you to summarize in approximately five minutes. Mr. Conray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. My name is Ron Condray, and I'm with the Monsanto Company in St. Louis as Director of Regulatory Management, and I'm here today on behalf of the Chemical Manufacturers Association. CMA appreciates this opportunity to share its views on the implementation of the Toxic Substances Control Act. CMA supported passage of the act in 1976 and have been actively involved ever since as an advocate in its implementation. Our observations after almost 12 years of working with the act, and I must say personally adding a few gray hairs uh, in that process, can be summarized in three brief statements. Number one, EPA has, in our estimation, made substantial progress in implementing the Act's objectives, and I'll touch briefly on that in a moment. Number two, TSCA's influence on the industry has been widespread, and positive changes in industry practice have resulted. Number three, progress under TSCA has not come without significant industry burdens, some of which we feel could be reduced without affecting health or the environment. Let me touch on the example of implementation that I made reference to earlier. And this deals specifically with EPA's pre-manufacturing notice review provisions. Over 10,000 chemicals have been reviewed by EPA's program that looks at health and environmental issues before the material can enter commerce. And where appropriate, EPA takes action. 20 to 30 percent of this number have been reviewed in depth and over 1,000 1, new chemicals, PMNs, have been suspended to allow EPA to, to, to gather additional information and to do more in-depth review. Over 225 voluntary testing agreements or voluntary controls have been implemented as a result of this review process. In addition, over 275 controls have been put in place by EPA using their authority under Section 5. These controls can include workplace controls, can include uh, use provisions, can also require testing. In addition to this, over 250 chemicals have been withdrawn from the review process in view of EPA's possible actions, and four materials have actually been banned outright and have not been allowed to enter into commerce. We think these statistics pretty well speak for themselves and graphically illustrate that TSCA's influence on the new chemical program has been substantial. While we support strong implementation, not all of EPA's programs have met with CMA's approval. Let me tick off a few of CMA's current concerns. Number one, TSCA provides EPA with very powerful information gathering capability. We feel EPA must be more selective in the use of this authority. And let me give you an example. EPA has proposed what is known as the, the Comprehensive Assessment Information Rule. This is a rule that utilizes a 100-page questionnaire to gather information about health, safety, environment, use, exposure, a whole variety of, of information, a very, very resource-intensive type rule. It's not at all clear to us how EPA plans to use all of this information in this 100-page uh, form for regulatory purposes. The information gathering must also be coupled with an effective information utilization technique. Literally thousands of health, environmental, exposure reports and studies and other information have been submitted to EPA under the TSCA provisions. 
This information is not easily accessible to the public, and in many cases, not even to the agency itself. And we feel strongly that the agency must put in a centralized data management, data retrieval system that will allow this valuable national asset, asset to be used. Number two, the data needs under the testing provisions of TSCA need to be focused toward risk assessment. That's the purpose that this data comes into the agency for. Number three, PMN follow-up orders must be administered in a way that does not unduly impede innovation. This is the new lifeblood of the, of the new materials that can come out of industry. This demands that EPA be open and straightforward as possible with new chemical manufacturers during this process. Number four, EPA is actively enforcing the Act, and approximately 400 TSCA inspections are performed annually. While we support rigorous enforcement, we believe that the penalties that have resulted from these and other enforcement activities in many cases have not been fair and even-handed. Huge fines for violations that do not have any apparent impact on health or the environment are unfortunately all too common. In spite of these and other concerns EPA has voiced over the years, on balance, we believe that EPA has made considerable and appropriate progress in implementing the Act. CMA is committed to continue to work with EPA and other interested parties to further the Act's mandate to protect human health and the environment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness is Mr. Fromman, uh, Health and Safety Director of Amalgamated uh, Clothing and Textile Workers. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Eric Fruman. I'm Director of the Occupational, uh, of Occupational Safety and Health for the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. On behalf of our President Jack Shankman and Secretary Treasurer Charlie Sally and our 250,000 members around the country, I want to commend the subcommittee for taking this interest in the problems of toxic chemical hazards and to express our appreciation for allowing us to offer a worker's viewpoint. It is an issue of vital concern to workers across the country and to all our citizens. Often the toxic chemical problems of workers are forgotten when discussing environmental hazards. However, workers do not lose their moral or legal rights to a safe and healthful environment when they enter the workplace. Furthermore, the public is, at large is quite concerned about worker exposure to toxic chemicals on the job. In a recent poll commissioned by EPA from the Roper Organization, worker exposure to toxic chemicals was second only to hazardous waste dumps in the public's concerns about serious environmental hazards. We as workers know, and we believe the public understands, that workers are basically society's guinea pigs when it comes to toxic chemicals and we refuse to accept that designation. Our testimony today will review several serious problems with the Toxic Substances Control Act, and at the end we offer recommendations for amendments. We would also respectfully request, however, the subcommittee to first repeal the Paperwork Reduction Act, and secondly, mandate EPA to either ban or stringently control the solvent called PERC, which is used in the dry cleaning industry. We've seen tremendous strides in the enactment of toxic substance legislation in the past two decades, including the Clean Air and Water Act, legislation on pesticides, and of course, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which created OSHA in 1970. However, there are serious gaps in this legislation. OSHA, for instance, does not have the authority to ban the production or use of specific chemicals. Neither can OSHA require the multinational chemical giants who produce chemicals in megaton quantities to properly test their products before the products are sold on the market. And as the National Academy of Sciences reported in 1984 for, quote, the great majority of chemicals in commerce data considered essential for conducting health hazard assessment are lacking. Thus, we still had a need after these laws for a wraparound authority in toxic substance control legislation, and this was the promise of the Toxic Substance Control Act. Also, following the establishment of TSCA, the leadership of the nation's major health agencies saw the wisdom of establishing the National Toxicology Program, a research program on toxicity. The program has played a vital role in stimulating well-coordinated toxicology research and providing an unbiased, competent, and ethical alternative to the irresponsible behavior of the chemical industry. 
It represents one of the best models for effective government action to protect the public health and is probably the only major government activity today which seriously challenges the overall power of the chemical industry in the area of toxic substance safety. Unfortunately, our experience under this law has been woefully disappointing. The testing program has been nearly a complete failure. There has been no meaningful regulation by EPA of serious toxins in widespread use, and I'll say more about the problems of formaldehyde in clothing and the solvent perk in dry cleaning in a minute. EPA's referrals of several problems to OSHA and other agencies have yielded no practical benefit, and worse, the public's role in the administration of the law has been completely stymied. Now, some of this failure has been the result of simple bureaucratic inertia. But much useful work has also been hindered by pro-industry ideologues in the Office of EPA's Administrator, in the Office of Management and Budget in the White House, and by Vice President Bush's Task Force on Regulatory Relief. But the major share for the blame lies unquestionably at the feet of the chemical industry itself. It has no shame, shows no compunctions about misleading the government, hiding from the public, and perverting the administration of our laws. And I think, Mr. Chairman, your own subcommittee has seen in the last week an example of this type of behavior. This corruption is an outrage. It will only be halted when the Congress amends the, the act to remedy these problems and assure our citizens, including America's workers, that someone indeed is looking out for their safety in the chemical workplace. I'd like to give two examples of serious toxic chemical hazards which EPA has either ignored or failed to adequately address. The first is formaldehyde. It's another megaton chemical. Formaldehyde is the 24th largest in its annual production of 5 billion pounds a year. Both the chemical industry and academic researchers showed in 1979 that it caused cancer in animals, and later studies showed it caused cancer in people, in workers. In 1981, under its chief, Ann Gorsuch, EPA refused to take any action and continued until it was sued by our friends in the Natural Resources Defense Council. OSHA likewise refused to take any action in response to our petitions and lawsuits. Finally, in 1984, EPA formally announced its concern about the two largest groups of people exposed to formaldehyde, garment, the million, one million garment workers and the several million people in mobile homes. But EPA then made another of its useless so-called referrals to OSHA on the problem of, of the garment industry and then announced that it had completed action. OSHA was finally moving toward action only because of our lawsuits and orders from the U.S. Court of Appeals here in Washington. However, it proposed and eventually adopted a formaldehyde standard so weak that it effectively exempted the garment industry, and EPA never objected. Our other main chemical, chemical of concern today is perchloroethylene, otherwise known as PERC. This is another megaton chemical with over 300,000 tons consumed annually in the United States. Half of that is used in the dry cleaning industry, involving over 15,000 dry cleaners employing about 100,000 workers around the country. The first evidence of cancer from PERC was released by the National Cancer Institute in 1977. In 1985, the National Toxicology Program showed clear evidence of cancer in animals from PERC at the same levels that OSHA allows workers to be exposed. In 1986, a government study showed a 155% increase in the rates of bladder and kidney cancer among dry cleaning workers. And in 1986, a risk assessment for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences predicted that one out of every 200 dry cleaning workers exposed at the current OSHA limit would, would die of cancer. To date, EPA has taken no formal action on PERC, nor has the cancer evidence resulted in any other limitations by EPA on PERC emissions into the environment. Currently, EPA routinely permits dry cleaning operations throughout the country to emit air contaminated by PERC at the same level as the OSHA limit, which was also found in 1985 to cause cancer. However, EPA has continued to collect data which show clearly the feasibility of cutting worker and consumer exposure by 90% or more through banning transfer type dry cleaning equipment, which already accounts for uh, only two-thirds of the uh, dry cleaning equipment today. One-third has already been eliminated. In response to this overwhelming evidence of a serious Main Street public health crisis from toxic chemicals, the American Public Health Association last spring called for the banning of transfer type equipment in dry cleaning plants and the mandate of closed systems. OSHA also ignored the problem, but this year it finally proposed changing its limit on PERC as part of a large-scale revision of many exposure limits. 
and completely failed to mention the cancer risk. What's more, proposed to cut the limit by only half of its current value, a level, again, shown to cause cancer. Once again, EPA has made no objection to this woeful confounding of our public health goals. It's difficult to imagine a more ludicrous scenario than those posed by the cases of formaldehyde and perchloroethylene. The regulatory provisions of the TSCA Act have failed. Indeed, EPA has admitted as much. In a February 19th memo this year, Mr. Elkins from EPA, from whom you'll hear shortly, said, I believe we should quickly and efficiently refer the most serious of the occupational problems we find to OSHA. And then he went on to admit, even though I know that this is an imperfect solution and does not guarantee us any risk reduction for our effort. There are serious problems as well with the toxicity testing provisions of the Act. These have overwhelmed us despite the best efforts of our national toxicology program. The deplorable lack of testing has been fully documented by the National Academy of Sciences, which reports that only 78 percent of the major chemicals produced in Congress have any toxic chemical, excuse me, have no toxic chemical testing whatsoever. It's completely intolerable and has been due primarily to the intransigence and obstructionism of the chemical industry. The promise of the Toxic Substances Control Act has been broken, torn apart on the shoals of agency indifference, OMB interference, and the unbridled treachery, for lack of a better word, by the chemical industry. As workers who often face the greatest risk from toxic chemicals, we implore the subcommittee to look beyond the excuses you will hear today from EPA and the industry. We hope you can appreciate the rampant fear in today's workforce and among the public at large about the uncontrolled use of toxic chemicals. If you do, you will quickly acknowledge the need to drastically reform the, the law. And if that's not possible, we would prefer you to repeal it. We would be much better off without today's illusion that somebody in the government must be watching out for these chemical hazards. Well, our testimony makes a number of recommendations for amendments. One of the key ones is the establishment of a na National Toxicology yeah, Trust Fund. Thank helpful. you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I just want to draw attention to the establishment of a na National Toxicology Trust next Fund. Minute, Thank helpful. you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I just want to draw attention to that one. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. the opportunity to testify. You bet. Ms. Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been involved in the implementation of TSCA since it was passed, and it's been 12 years. And I think it's fair to say, as you said in your opening statement, that high expectations and millions of dollars have been expended and mostly we're quite disappointed. The record of accomplishment by EPA is so sparse as to be a public embarrassment. This one? Okay. Very few chemicals have been regulated. A slightly larger, although still very small number, have been required to be tested. Chemicals are still routinely introduced into commerce with no toxicity testing performed on them. And because of the heavy burden that the statute imposes on EPA to really prove the case against chemicals it believes are toxic or even wishes to have tested, the toxic substances are still given the benefit of the doubt as to toxicity on issues of scientific uncertainty or where there are no data as to their toxicity. It is not an exaggeration to say that TSCA is not a serious weapon in EPA's arsenal of authorities for dealing with risks to health and the environment. After so many years of involvement with the statute, I, I have concluded, and I think it's fair to say that the unreasonable risk standard that's written into the law bears a large share of the blame. It's true that while there have been many people working very hard at EPA for many years, there's been a lack of vision on the part of the leadership there. There have been deliberate attempts, particularly over the last eight years, to uh, neutralize the statute as an independent regulatory authority. And there has been, in some cases, just a lack of will. But it's a problem that requires both vigorous implementation and some changes in the law to make it work. The unreasonable risk test is being interpreted by EPA in such a way that virtually no risk has been found to be unreasonable. The statute included requirements that EPA impose a ban on the manufacture and all, all but totally enclosed uses of PCBs. From the very beginning, the agency was unable to function with that standard. Its initial effort resulted in an exemption from the ban for more than 99 percent of the PCBs in use. The same has been true for a laundry list of chemicals that appear in the legislative history and some of which have been discussed here today. We've been involved for many years on the effort EPA has vainly expended in trying to ban and phase down the remaining uses of asbestos. 
the database on asbestos is better than it is for just about any other chemical that we know. We know that it is a human carcinogen and is responsible for a lot of human disease. EPA has been unable to impose regulations either banning the 70 percent of use that's identified as having good substitutes readily available or to come to a conclusion on a rulemaking that would impose a phase out on, on the aspe remaining asbestos uses leads us to conclude really that if they can't do it for asbestos, how are they ever going to do it for the myriad of other toxic substances for which the database is nowhere near as good. We believe that the law should be changed so that a significant risk standard is the one EPA has to meet rather than an unreasonable risk standard because unreasonable balances the impact on the industry affected by the regulation against the often speculative and frequently um, uncertain number of people who will be made ill by exposure to the chemical and repeatedly the agency has been unable to come to a conclusion that favors doing something about the substance. That test is also applied for deciding whether something should be tested. The possible future impact of regulation should the testing prove positive is a deterrent to going forward and requiring testing to see whether the substance is in fact hazardous. Decisions on hazard are really scientific and questions of economic impact really belong at the regulatory stage and not at the testing stage. So we would, we would urge, if changes are made in TSCA, that an absence of data or a reasonable suspicion of hazard standard be used for deciding whether testing is necessary and a significant risk standard for the actual regulation. We've given some specific examples with respect to the major regulatory provisions of the statute in the testimony. I would say with respect to testing rules that the new chemicals program has been the most successful under the law. We've just heard representative of the chemical industry talk about that significantly. He did not say one word about existing chemicals, which is probably the worst record that EPA has in implementing the statute. But even with the so-called success of the new chemicals program, it's still based primarily on educated guesses, structural similarities to known toxic substances. You still have, according to EPA in their June issue of their Chemicals in Progress Bulletin, more than a majority of chemicals being introduced into commerce, or more than a majority of, of PMNs being submitted to EPA with no toxicity data, whatever. Interestingly enough, in response to the passage of TSCA in this country, the European Economic Community and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development have gone forward with the EEC with a mandatory pre-market testing program and the OECD with recommendations for pre-market testing. The U.S. trails far behind our trading partners in this respect and with the perverse result that American manufacturers of chemicals are willing to do more to protect the health and environment of the people in Europe who might be exposed to their chemicals than they are for Americans. With respect to, I've spoken to section six, I would like to add one other. I strongly support what my colleague from the um, Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union said about formaldehyde in particular. We've worked on EPA's valiant and vain efforts to deal with formaldehyde. The more than 100 million people they identified as being at significant risk of cancer in 1984 from exposure to formaldehyde are still unprotected. And the agency, although reviewing their regulatory options for the last four years, has no proposal out, has said privately to us that even if they put out a proposal, they have no data with which to support it because the industry in response to anticipated possible regulation has moved to reduce the emissions of formaldehyde from wood products so that we really don't have any good data right now on what the current exposures might be. They're, therefore, they would probably, without a massive data gathering effort, be unable to sustain a regulation on formaldehyde at this point. I want to mention two other two other things. The confidentiality provisions of TSCA have operated in a way that virtually precludes effective public participation in many of the uh, proceedings at the agency. With respect to new chemicals, there's so little information available to the public that there is literally no public participation in the new chemicals program. And even in regulatory proceedings, I gave an example in the testimony about the asbestos ban proceeding. EPA asked the public, what is a reasonable phase-out period for getting rid of the remaining uses of asbestos? They gathered data from about 400 companies using asbestos and asked for comment on whether their projections of future use were reasonable, except those projections were withheld from public review on grounds of confidentiality and the, the pages in the, in the support document that the public was advised to look at to see the reasonableness of the projections were blank. That kind of process and that kind of secrecy is totally inconsistent with what you have done under Section 313 of SARA on what the, every other environmental statute says with, re, with respect to emissions into air, water, 
elsewhere of toxic substances. And I really think that the whole question of how far the confidentiality protection under TSCA is going to go needs to be reviewed and revisited and cut down to true legitimate trade secrets, formulas for substances, but not just whatever the submitter of a notice wishes to claim confidential, which is where we are today. And the last point is that EPA's enforcement problems under TSCA are significant. This, this subcommittee looked at the Texas Houston Pipeline case as an example of a problem with PCB disposal and enforcement. Unlike the other environmental statutes, there's no state program component in TSCA. EPA has to do it all by themselves. And although they certainly try very hard and they've signed some cooperative agreements with state agencies to help with enforcement, it's really just a token. They don't even have the benefit of citizen enforcement to help the way it does under the Clean Water Act because EPA consistently tells companies to keep their records in their files rather than reporting them, their compliance to EPA. EPA will ask for it if it wants it. It's therefore totally inaccessible to the public and the provision of Section 20 which provides for citizen enforcement is effectively written out of the law. We would also, in, in closing, urge that if, if TSCA reauthorization does finally happen, and I would certainly urge you to try to make that happen, that some goals be written into the law because I think it helps and has helped under other statutes where the decision makers know what they're trying to achieve, which is not the case under TSCA. And to that end, we would urge goals be, first, that humans, as a matter of policy, humans and the environment should be protected against involuntary exposures to toxic substances. In carrying out its duties under TSCA, EPA should err on the side of safety in resolving scientific controversies about potentially adverse health and environmental effects, rather than giving the chemicals the benefit of the doubt. And third, that the commerce in toxic substances should be discouraged and the development and use of safe substitutes should be encouraged. EPA is not doing that routinely in the few regulatory proceedings that they go forward with. They could use the phase-out authority to accomplish this significantly, but they have not. And in fact, I mean, given the history of 12 years of having very broad discretion and exercising it very infrequently, we would urge that they be given a, a series of specific tasks with deadlines and some measures in order to objectively evaluate whether they're getting where you want them to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Karen Florini. I'm a staff attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund. EDF has long been interested in TSCA from the initial legislative enactment, and our interest in the statute has uh, recently been piqued even further by our participation in a three-year legal proceeding against EPA with respect to dioxin. Section 21 of TSCA enables citizens to petition EPA to undertake regulatory action. We did so in 1984. The agency denied the petition in major respects, and we exercised our statutory right to go forward into a de novo proceeding in federal district court. We were urging the agency to uh, regulate all emissions into air, water, and on land, and in chemical products of dioxins. TSCA has an unusual ability, unusual in the context of other EPA statutes, to deal with persistent bioaccumulative pollutants because it allows EPA to intervene in any stage of the manufacture, processing, use, or disposal, and whether through any medium. These issues are of significant importance, as we have found, not only in the context of our dioxin litigation, but also in the context of the solid waste management work, which we have recently been undertaking. TSCA, unfortunately, has not been well utilized. There has been too much emphasis on information gathering and not enough on action. To date, the saga is primarily one of missed opportunities. This emphasis on information gathering showed up particularly clearly in the context of the dioxin litigation. EPA asserted that in order to issue a Section 6 rule limiting the amount of dioxin in chemical products, the agency would not only require information on toxicity of dioxins and on potential for exposure, but also information on economic costs that would result from reduction of dioxin content, information on incremental risk reduction that could result from lowering of current levels to various alternative levels, and so on. This is partly the result, perhaps, of statutory language. Unfortunately, the agency appears to have chosen to maximize the, dis the uh, infelicities in the statutory language to the greatest degree possible. However, we would urge at this point that the uh, statute be amended. As Ms. Warren testified, we think that the unreasonable risk standard is 
essentially infeasible, that there should be a change instead to a significant risk standard. We also urge deletion of the least burdensome approach language. Similarly, we think that the emphasis on using other statutes in lieu of TOSC is not necessary. The question ought to be how can you most efficiently deal with the risk where the risk is of a highly persistent bioaccumulative nature in particular, TOSCA will often provide the best handle. With respect to a few specific issues, I'd like to say uh, we have grave objections to EPA's recent proposal to alter the uh, regulations concerning the commencement of rulemaking under Section 6. As the agency has rather candidly admitted, they are attempting to do so largely in order to undercut the efficacy of the Section 21 citizen petition proceeding. Uh, they now, the current regulations indicate that a Section 6 proceeding begins with proposal of a rule. The agency would like to change that to say that the rulemaking can begin with initiation of a formal study. That allows the agency at its leisure to convert a request for action from a citizen into a request for study. As Ms. Warren has also indicated in the formaldehyde context, the agency doesn't seem to need any additional encouragement for substituting study for action. In closing, I'd like to just mention briefly the biotechnology issues that have also been regulated under the rubric of TOSCA. We think that if EPA wishes to continue to use biotechnology, it would be uh, regulate biotechnology under TOSCA, it would be helpful for Congress to clarify the authority of EPA to address genetically engineered microorganisms and in particular to provide for long-term monitoring. Unlike chemicals, which are not capable of altering their form or reproducing and increasing in scope, uh, that is a fundamental characteristic of life. And the long-term monitoring is necessary in order to take those uh, factors into account. We also would ask the committee to join with us in encouraging the Office of Management and Budget to promptly release the TOSCA regulatory package that they have apparently had for several months now. Uh, those regulations have apparently been circulated to industry but have not been released for public review or comment, which we do not think is a desirable occurrence, and we hope the committee will urge the prompt release and proposal of those regulations. Thank you very much, Ms. Borini. Chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Freeman, let me start with you, if I could, this morning. In your testimony, you, you recommend the repeal of the Paperwork Reduction Act. Now, as you know, we in here in Congress, we in Congress uh, have a lot of competing demands against us. Uh, obviously, uh, we hear from small businesses uh, that feel like um, there is too much reporting uh, with respect to uh, paperwork and filling out forms. There's also a counterbalancing need to protect the safety of workers. Uh, could you explain to the subcommittee how we can hopefully ensure adequate information and the protection of the public health and safety if we repeal the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act? Well, the, uh, the law in itself is a nice idea. Uh, it, it would be good if all of us could have a nice short tax form to fill out. If, uh, you know, tax day is, is no pleasure for those of us who stay up late filling out a, a 1040. And for uh, employers and uh, the chemical industry, paperwork can be a problem. But what, uh, and, and, and uh, perhaps the, uh, it's possible that the law could be constructed in such a way that you could prevent its abuse by those who would attempt to use it and succeed in using it to completely frustrate the regulations that uh, have been issued by EPA or OSHA or other health agencies. But our concern is that that the Office of Management and Budget, which that law is, you know, authorizes to review regulations, has so completely twisted and perverted that law that there's virtually no way, given a, a, hostile, a hostile administration, an administration hostile to the public health and safety, hostile to government safety regulations, there's no way to, to, to prevent them once they use, once they have the law in hand. I mean, if, if it's true that patriotism is the last refuge of scoundrels, well, the Paperwork Reduction Act is the last barricade used by the White House through the Office of Management and Budget in its constant battles to block public safety and health regulations. And it's illegal, and they've been doing it since 1981. 
since, since the President issued his executive order. And just two months ago, the Court of Appeals in, in uh, Philadelphia, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, finally caught OMB in the process, ruled that its use of the Paperwork Reduction Act to stop a, an OSHA standard on the public's right to know was patently illegal. It was a unanimous decision. And we think uh, that decision and others, which we think are coming in, uh, in the case of formaldehyde and others, will demonstrate that there's simply no way to give that authority to the, to the Office of Management and Budget without leading to this sort of abuse. Now, if, uh, if you can begin oversight, to summarize your answer here, Mr. Well, I, I think it's not a simple problem because the, the abuse has been extraordinary. I mean, there's been a, a total blockage at the White House under the Paperwork Reduction Act by OMB of these essential safety regulations. If you need strong oversight of the agencies, well, maybe we all have to work harder to do that. Uh, if you need to limit paperwork, do it statute by statute. But this broad kind of legislation has been abused so badly that OMB gets away with literally bureaucratic murder. Mr. Conroy, let me move to you if I could. Uh, you testified that uh, the CMA supports the effective enforcement of TSCA, also the fair and even-handed treatment uh, to violators. And you raised some concerns in your testimony about EPA's fairness. Could you cite some specific examples where you think EPA has not been even-handed in its enforcement or uh, with respect to violators? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, an example, and it's a hypothetical example, but I think it's one that brings the point home. Under the pre-manufacturing notice review provisions of TSCA, if, a, if a, notif a notification is not made for a new chemical that has a new structure or, an, or particularly a new polymer substance that has a new monomer potentially at a level above 2%, this then is a, is a violation of the act. And that is a very complex provision. And within manufacturing, you may well have polymer applications where you're changing a monomer composition in a minor fashion. A research engineer or something out in the plant may be doing this for uh, process improvement. And all of a sudden, unbeknown to him because of the complexity of Tosca, he's created a new chemical. Mr. Conroy, answer my question. Give me some specific examples since you did okay. mention in your testimony. A polymer that does not have any biological health significance, in other words, a, a, a polymer that is not, does not create a health or environmental problem, can be a violation of the law unbeknownst to the person who is actually making this polymer change and therefore can be fined huge amounts of monies in the multi-million pound per year, multi-million dollar range, which really do not create health or environmental concerns. In other words, that's Do you have a, some specific examples, going back to the question, where EPA has been unfair or not even-handed in its treatment? That's what I'm looking for in this question. Well, what I'm trying to show is that those are, are not health or environmental problems, and yet they carry large fines that are not even-handed relative to other statutes. Well, do you have examples of that? Give us specific examples. I, 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 I don't want to bring a specific company in, involved because I think that can be, I, I'd rather not do that. Well, but as is I say, there, are there examples? Yes. Would there you are. like to provide that to the subcommittee? I'd be happy to, you, right. You also criticize the current practice where EPA makes its referrals to OSHA. Um, no, Mr. Fruman did that, I'm sorry. Right. What's your position, what's the CMA's position on that? Well, we think OSHA is the proper place to control workplace issues. We think they are the organization that's set up with the infrastructure, with the technical ability to regulate the workplace. They have the legis legislative authority and mandate to do so. And when EPA finds that that's where the risk is associated, we think it's very appropriate that they hand that off to OSHA to take the appropriate actions. You also uh, raise concerns about the quality of information upon which EPA uh, bases its decision. Uh, I think all of us who follow this realize that in order to regulate a risk, you've got to know the nature of that risk and to the extent and method of exposure, do you not? That's right. That's correct. Now, among other things, a regulatory agency needs the following. Uh, see if you agree with these. The processing of the chemical, they need to understand the processing of the chemical, correct? Right. Do they need to know how workers are exposed and how many exposures there are? Yes. And how the waste are disposed of? Yes. Okay. And whether or not there are admissions into the air, uh, and what control technology is used. Right. All right. Now, in your testimony, uh, you also say that uh, in the judgment of CMA, EPA does not have uh, or does not give significant attention to exposure information in evaluating its need for testing. 
Now, I understand that's the very kind of information uh, which we've got to have in order to make a comprehensive assessment information rule. Uh, now, CMA has raised objections regarding the information requirements to this rule. Can you explain to the subcommittee on the one hand why CMA criticizes EPA uh, for the adequacy of exposure data, but on the other hand is objecting, objecting to the extent of the information collection requirements of the rule? Our, our basic concern with the, the CAIR, the comprehensive rule, is the fact that it goes beyond just merely exposure information. If the agency wants exposure information, we think they should ask for exposure information. The, the uh, preliminary assessment information rule that is in place now, for example, does deal specifically with exposure information, and the agencies use that particular rule extensively to ask just for that type of information. How many people are exposed? What is the process that's involved? Is it an open or is it a closed process? How many downstream workers might be involved? And that rule is in place and is being effectively used. Our concern with the CAIR rule is it's, it's a generic rule designed to answer every question one could want to answer in a very comprehensive fashion. When, when you may just be there's only one nugget that is really necessary, one piece of information, but here's the entire care rule that goes much beyond that. But without it, you don't have a total assessment of the risk, do you? Without all the information. Well, but you may not need all the information. If, if there is limited exposure, why gather in-depth toxicological information? Ms. Florini, do you agree with that? No, I'm not, Mr. Chairman. Would you like to I, comment on that? Certainly. I think that the uh, experience that we've had under TOSCA to date has been uh, one where EPA incrementally collects each piece of information as they be believe it becomes relevant. Res the uh, result of that is that in a dozen years of TOSCA's existence, there have been essentially no regulations under Section 6, which, as I mentioned, does provide overarching authority for dealing with complex chemicals. The fact of the matter is that if you wait and decide each snippet is useful in turn, then you will get extremely little in the way of prompt or effective action. Okay. Let me ask you another question, uh, one final question. I turn to Mr. Towns. Uh, Mr. Conroy, has CMA met with OMB with respect to this proposal we are just talking about, the uh, Comprehensive Assessment Information Rule? I really can't answer that personally. I, would you I find out if find CMA out has, and to. if so, uh, I'd like to leave the record open uh, for the submission of correspondence uh, between uh, CMA and OMB uh, regarding uh, their public meetings uh, between April 88, uh, non-public meetings, uh, okay. April 88 and August 87, if that's would be provided for the record. Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, continue with Mr. Conray, too. What criteria would you use to exempt new chemicals from PMN review? Uh, in other words, how would you change the current review process? There are certain categories of chemicals that, that by their very nature pose very, very limited risk. One category is, is the polymers, the, the kinds of materials that basically bind up into very, very long structures that, that are, are in, in essence biologically inert. Those are the kinds of materials that might well prove to be uh, good examples of exemptions from in-depth review by, by EPA or even any review whatsoever. Another type would be materials that have very, very limited exposure, materials that either because of their nature they're very small quantities or that they're very low uh, potential exposure because of the processing involved. They never basically see the light of day. Those are other types of materials that might be possible for exemption under the, uh, under the, the PMN provision. Thank you. I understand that cost is one of the concerns by the industry in being subjected to this review process. Uh, can you outline what those costs would be? Do you have any idea? The costs the cost vary extensively depending on the, the type of chemical that's involved. There is uh, a cost initially of completing the information collection that is required as part of the, the pre-manufacturing notice, providing information on the chemistry, providing process information, pulling together the available data that one has on health, safety, and environmental exposure, and putting that together in, a, in the package as required under the pre-manufacturing notice rules to submit this to EPA. That's one cost. There is then also the cost in working with EPA if EPA raises concerns through their process. 
And those costs can, in many cases, be, be very, very extensive. Uh, I know from a personal example, we had one uh, pre-manufacturing notice that involved discussion and dialogue for over a year between EPA and, and our technical people revolved, involving our, uh, concerns about the, the, uh, the toxicity, concerns about the exposure, back and forth. Those costs are basically lost opportunities. That year that that material set in the review process, it was not out being reviewed by potential customers and, and running into the possibility of utilization. The last cost are the costs implied, imposed by the actual consent orders that are put in place by EPA if they truly have a concern. And those costs may involve industrial hygiene workplace controls where there may be uh, personnel protective equipment required. There may be notification through, through uh, labeling and, ma and material safety data sheets. There may be customer notification. There may be use controls. All of those are, are costs. And then lastly, as part of the 5E compliance orders, there may well be testing requirements. And we're seeing this provision of, of the regulations being used more and more by the agency to require testing, usually on a tiered basis as the chemical moves into larger and larger volumes to have various testing performed. Mm -hmm. Being some review process is necessary, aren't we better off having a strict review at the beginning rather than playing catch up at the end if a toxic substance slips through the review process? I would agree with that totally, and I think that's exactly what the pre-manufacturing review is. It is a pre-review. The manufacturer cannot make the material for commercial purposes until EPA has gone through that review, and as I say, in many cases, that review is extended for long periods of time to prevent appropriate uh, review and additional data. So I would agree with you totally that that review should be done up front, and it is done up front. Would it help the industry? if EPA better identified their scientific concerns? Uh, and if so, give me an example of that. Yes, it would. Uh, EPA utilizes uh, structure activity, which is a way of looking at a new chemical and comparing that chemical with, with other chemicals that have similar chemical structure or, or similar biological activity. That, that particular technique is a very powerful and useful technique and one that, uh, that every toxicologist professional person would use in their evaluation of a chemical. But it's important because of the scientific uncertainties in that process that industry understand the procedures that the agency uses. And so yes, it would be very helpful to industry to know what is the agency's parameters and criteria they use in, in the application of structure activity. And also a similar situation applies in the use of their exposure criteria. And EPA has recently made available some of the criteria that they are, are proposing to use in terms of exposure criteria, volume of material made, number of people exposed, number of hours exposure, all of that is very useful to, to, to manufacturers as they plan to provide the information that is needed and appropriate for EPA review. Let me switch to Mrs. Florini. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can we improve the review process for new chemicals under this act without new legislation? Yes, I think the authority within TOSCA is sufficient to allow EPA to do that. And if I may, I think I'd like to take off from the, the answer given by the last witness um, <clears throat> with respect to structure activity relationships. While those can, in fact, and, and are used to uh, provide some possible identification of biologically active molecules, they cannot uh, be used as they're currently being used at EPA to identify negatives. Failure to find uh, an agreement between a proposed new product and an existing library of chemicals, no matter how extensive that library may be, does not preclude the possibility that the new chemical may act with very great potency. This is because our understanding of the toxicological fundamental principles is still really quite limited. We simply don't know enough of, to extrapolate from the shape of a molecule to its ability to induce a number of toxic effects, not only cancer, which has historically been EPA's primary focus of concern, but also immunotoxicity, organ system toxicity, neurotoxicity. The assumption that we can uh, extrapolate from structure activity to this larger range of toxic effects is not well founded. But EPA, I believe, does have the authority under TOSCA as it, as it is currently written to have a more aggressive uh, package of testing requirements as is currently the case in Europe. All right, let me ask you this then, a very basic question. Are states receiving enough support from EPA 
in their efforts to monitor toxic substances. As Ms. Warren uh, noted, I believe, before you arrived, uh, it, the um, TSCA has a relatively limited state role, which is un unfortunate. Uh, certainly, I think EPA could take more of a leadership role in um, identifying and, and disseminating toxic information, toxicology information that would assist the states in doing this process. But fundamentally, I think the issue of how do you deal with information on new chemicals, how do you efficiently gather and evaluate information on existing chemicals is something that requires a substantial degree of expertise. And it may well be that the more efficient way for that to be done by our society as a whole is to keep that relatively centralized within EPA. M Mr. Fruman, would you comment on that? Yeah, I, we, um, we're very concerned, as we said in our testimony, about the, the use of this uh, cancer-causing solvent, PERC, in the dry cleaning industry. So we did a survey of all the states around the country to see what enforcement programs they had regarding the use of PERC in dry cleaning under either state toxic substance laws or under state uh, air pollution laws. And we've surveyed major cities as well, including New York City, where Mr. Towns, I'm a constituent of yours. And uh, it turns out that almost every state and major cities do virtually no inspections of dry cleaning shops to see whether or not the amounts of perk being pumped out into the air from the dry cleaning machinery uh, exceeds the uh, allowable levels. And so what it turns out is that there, there are tremendous amounts of this uh, synthetic organic chemical proven to cause cancer in animals, suspected of causing cancer in people, being pumped out the air of dry cleaning shops into uh, neighborhoods and apartment buildings uh, all over this country and certainly in the major cities. And in, uh, in, e in New York City, it's, if you have a complaint about the chemicals coming from a dry cleaning shop, it's almost impossible to get an inspection from the city health department, which passes it off to the city EPA and so forth. So at the state level and at the local level, the resources simply are not there to deal with toxic chemical problems. That's why we need uh, a revision of this law to force EPA to take the kind of action they need rather than simply, as Mr. Kudre would uh, prefer, passing it off to OSHA, knowing full well that nothing will happen there and that no regulations will ensue and that neither the workers nor the public will get protected. I have to say that it would be nice if the CMA came and told OSHA they thought OSHA should issue regulations. Uh, they tell EPA to give it to OSHA and then uh, when it comes time for OSHA to do something, uh, CMA says, well, EPA was wrong. You know, they referred to you, but they were wrong. And uh, if we could get them to say the same thing in both hearings, we'd all be a little better off. Right. Thank you very much. I see we have a, a very serious problem. Mr. Chairman, I realize I do not have any more time to yield back, so I just yield. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Townsend. Let me thank our... Yes, Ms. Warren. Can I ask one thing on the state question that no one has raised here, but the, the states are barred by the confidentiality prohibitions from getting access to information that is submitted to EPA under TSCA. And last year, a group under the auspices of the Conservation Foundation, a group of state environmental officials, some environmental uh, group representatives and some ministry representatives proposed an amendment to TSCA which would make it possible for the state agencies to be able to get access to that information so that their toxic substances programs could be more effective, help EPA at the same time. And in response to Mr. Town's question, I mean, is there a need for legislation? I think the answer is yes, there is a need for legislation. I think that Roger Canerva, who's going to testify next, I was just going to say, you've now let us into our next witness, because mm -hmm. that's exactly what he is going to do. And with that, I want to thank this panel this morning. I think they've outlined very clearly the two sides of the issue. And I invite you to stay around, because I think we're going to answer, or at least attempt to answer, some of the questions which you've posed this morning when EPA, our final panel, is here. Thank all of you all for coming this morning. Our next witness is Mr. Roger uh, Canerva, uh, the manager, Canerva, excuse me, Canerva, the manager of the environmental programs for the state of Illinois' Environmental Protection Agency. If he would come forward at this time. Mr. Canerva, you have any objection to being sworn in? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Welcome. 
We're glad to have you here in Washington today and look forward to your insight as a, an administrator of a state program on what we can do better. Uh, your entire testimony will be made part of the record. At this time, we'd ask you to summarize. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one principal purpose in appearing before you today, and the panelists before you have certainly uh, helped present uh, part of the issue and that is I want to convince you that it now makes good sense to include the states in a meaningful way in the operations of Tosca. I believe that such action would result in better regulation of toxic chemicals by addressing certain weaknesses which exist for both Tosca and the federal state environmental pollution control laws. Now many states, including Illinois, are extensively involved in the daily operations of the major national programs for clean water, clean air, hazardous waste, safe drinking water, and cleanup. In one way or another, these programs and other state-specific programs emphasize protection from toxic chemicals. In fact, many states have seen their involvement with toxics grow by leaps and bounds over the past decade. During this time, some of us have come to understand that we are caught in a vicious and dangerous cycle. We cannot adequately control toxic pollutants at the endpoints of emission, discharge, or disposal when we are prevented by law from knowing what potentially hazardous chemicals are coming at us from the front end of chemical usage. As things stand today, then, we are usually caught being one or more steps behind the next round of toxics problems. Here is where TOSCA fits into this regulatory puzzle. TOSCA is structured to regulate new chemicals before they are released, as you all are aware. Under the provisions of Section 14, however, the US EPA cannot disclose confidential business information about toxic chemicals to the states. This prohibition also restricts access by the states to data about existing chemicals, which may be problems as well. Furthermore, TOSCA does not provide any meaningful opportunity for other traditional types of state participation, such as compliance monitoring. Under these circumstances, an important opportunity to better manage and interrelate the before-the-fact chemical control program under TOSCA and the after-the-fact toxics control programs under federal state environmental laws is being neglected. I believe that we can design a better approach for regulation of toxic chemicals. Toward this end, I have provided the subcommittee with a responsible agenda for a careful and gradual phase-in of the opportunity for state participation. This agenda would start with providing access to confidential data via cooperative agreements, move to the use of states for compliance monitoring, and conclude with new procedures for coordinated pre-manufacture notification review. As an attachment, I've also provided specific language for access to data. Uh, it's the same language that Jackie Warren mentioned that was developed by that TOSCA dialogue group under the Conservation Foundation. We appreciate being included in today's hearing. We'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. And le let's get into that, because I think that's really the, uh, the basic message uh, that you bring to us today, and that is, is that the key to successful state, area, uh, state efforts is going to be a variety of statutes that we need to start looking at to include you all. Let's, let's get into the specific confidentiality about the business information. Tell me how uh, we can satisfy businesses' concerns about legitimate con claims of confidentiality uh, on this information, as well as trying to balance the, the other interest, which is the state's need for that information in order to enforce the law. How do we solve that problem? The language that we worked out in that dialogue group attempted to do just that. And we proposed this cooperative agreement approach wherein a state would need to show US EPA that they had a substantially equivalent protection as that that's provided under section or under TOSCA's requirements for US EPA. Now that could happen in one of two ways. A number of states have trade secret protection provisions anyway. My agency, uh, we deal with data at a state level, independent of TOSCA, that involves some trade secrets. And we, of course, have procedures for keeping that confidential. And some states actually provide an exemption from their Freedom of Information Law, the State Freedom of Information Act, 
uh, if they have to handle very uh, sensitive information. So we set up a test of the substantial equivalence through this cooperative agreement mechanism uh, and, we, and the industry people that participate in that dialogue process were, were satisfied that that would give them the protection they needed. Well, I think that's an important, uh, important point. L let me go back in history. What kind of examples are you aware of having followed this where states have not acted responsible with that information? Are there legitimate concerns by business or is this just something that uh, they believe uh, uh, could happen? Well, right now, it's a, something they believe could happen. I mean, we have not had access to that information. US EPA uh, got sued early in the game. Uh, the, they explained that to us when they came to the dialogue group, uh, got clobbered in court, uh, pulled in their wings, and have been, you know, have been under a very tight reign ever since. So we just, we haven't had access to that information. We don't know. Well, let me ask you another area real quickly here. now. As you know, there are some instances where EPA will choose not to regulate at all in a processing unit because they don't have their personnel. Frankly, they're understaffed. Or they don't have someone at the factory on site. Are there circumstances under which, for example, the state of Illinois might want to take on that responsibility to regulate the chemical where EPA has decided not to regulate? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, that, the way you phrase that question, goes further than what I had talked about, at least up to now, in the testimony we've done. For instance, I saw the state's role in the pre-manufacturing notification review being providing some sort of ground truth, since we're out there and know this situation better, uh, about exposure information, for instance, or how materials would be disposed. You're now suggesting with that question that the state would want to take part in the threshold decision of whether or not there's an unreasonable risk. Uh, that's one I would have to give a lot more thought to. I, what that would do, there was extensive state participation, is tend to turn that into, uh, into 50 decision processes. And there probably is a concern there for a national manufacturing industry uh, that that would be too diffuse a, a decision-making process. I what about the example, though, uh, where the, the processing or, of a chemical is done in only one state? In other words, it's not done in 50 different states. In other words, this particular thing we're looking at is only in one state, like the state of Illinois. And EPA chooses not to regulate. Would there be circumstances where you all might want to accept that responsibility? I see. That's, I, I didn't really have that in mind. That's a good example. Uh, I think we uh, eventually would be interested in something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something obviously we need to look at because if EPA cries lack of staff, lack, lack of personnel, but in a small town or community where something's processed, the state of Illinois may have the uh, necessary incentives to do it, but uh, under present law, they wouldn't have the ability or right to do it, would they? That's correct. Okay, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank you, too, for being here. What specific changes would you like to see in the Toxic Control Act, which would give states a better handle on protecting the environment? What would you like to see? Well, three things, really. Uh, the first is the access to the confidential business information. It just makes no sense for the states to be running around blindfolded, uh, chase, trying to chase down chemicals. Uh, when in fact they could know what's being uh, manufactured in their in their state. Uh, so that access is the most important issue, I think, initially. Secondly, some involvement for the states in compliance monitoring. Uh, we're out there, we're inspecting facilities for other reasons. In some cases, we're at the same manufacturing facilities that US EPA is regulating under TSCA, and we're there for an air pollution inspection or something else. And it's just frustrating not to be able to go the next step and do some additional work out there at those facilities, following up on pat use patterns. You know, after a pre-manufacturing review, additional changes in use can take place, uh, and US EPA will not be on top of it necessarily. We could follow up there. Uh, the third thing that I would suggest is that we get involved in the 
in the pre-manufacturing review itself, the upfront review. And, and your question earlier was excellent about test, er, evaluating these chemicals before they're released. I mean, we have a tremendous cost chasing them around, trying to regulate them after their air emissions or their water discharges. So there's costs on the tail end, too. So having us participate more extensively and effectively in the upfront review of these for disposal information, exposure information, and that sort of thing uh, would make a lot of sense to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Canerva. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate this. I think it's helpful when we get uh, states like Illinois that are very active in this area to come in. Your testimony and the records you've helped us build will uh, hopefully assist us as we look at this in the future. And you might think about some of those questions we've asked. If you have additional thoughts, we'll leave that record open for you to make some comments. Thank you. Our next witness is J. William Hersey, President of the National Federation of Federal Employees. If he would come forward at this time. Mr. Hersey, do you have any objection to being sworn in? No, no. Stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Welcome this morning. We will submit your full testimony into the record. And at this time, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the 1,200 scientists, engineers, and other professionals at EPA. Pull that microphone real close. <laughs> got a soft voice. On behalf of the 1,200 scientists, engineers, and other professional employees at EPA headquarters that my union represents, I thank you for the opportunity to testify on the situation that exists at EPA headquarters now with respect to toxicity being expressed in our employees due to exposure to carpeting. Uh, to further put my testimony in perspective, I also, in addition to my union duties, uh, am senior scientist in the risk analysis unit in the Office of Toxic Substances. My testimony will cover the national scope of this problem, which has uh, uh, been uncovered as we've gotten into the investigation of the EPA situation, the application of TSCA to that national problem, and the reluctance of certain EPA risk managers to use EPA's risk control criteria to address the situation. I might say that EPA employees have been struggling for at least two years to get a comprehensive air quality program at EPA headquarters that could be a model for the nation. As you know, that building has had uh, severe problems for a long time. Uh, it looks as though that this particular toxic incident, incident has now precipitated the development of a program, and under uh, Bob Axelrad's direction, we're happy to see uh, the outlines of such a program developing. Uh, however, his program focuses narrowly or broadly, if you will, on the whole air quality program and doesn't uh, really focus in on the specifics of the toxic emanations from carpeting, which is the subject of my testimony today. Another crucial element that we would like to see in, a, in an indoor air program at EPA is a comprehensive health survey. Uh, what we get from EPA management when we raise this issue is well, we have to get it cleared through OMB. We have to see if there's going to be enough money. And if we can develop an appropriate instrument, maybe possibly sometime next year, maybe we'll get something for you. Uh, we don't think that that's nearly good enough. With respect to this problem, last October, EPA began to install carpeting at its headquarters. Almost immediately, employees began to complain of nausea, dizziness, tingling in the extremities, itchy skin, a, uh, a whole suite of symptoms reminiscent of mononucleosis and the flu. Um, EPA began a program of air monitoring, which didn't show much of anything in the way of known toxic agents. At a stormy April meeting among EPA managers, workers, and union representatives, EPA management said that the air in EPA headquarters was as good as in my living room, according to the manager, which precipitated uh, people storming out of the room in tears and a, uh, just a terrible scene. Uh, the union then officially went to Assistant Administrator Charles Grizzle with a letter along with the news uh, coverage that had been uh, published in the Washington Times the previous day and asked officially for a halt of installation of that carpeting, which Mr. Grizzle did. He also created a task force at that time to look into the problem and uh, as he charged the, uh, the task force to look into ways to go on using the carpeting. 
It quickly became obvious to us that the, car, that the task force was created not to fully investigate a toxic uh, incident in the workplace, but rather to transfer responsibility for carpet installation from one management unit to another and to get on with the job in a way that would create the minimal squawk from employees. The reason I say that is that the task force recommended no systematic study of employee reports of illness. There was no attempt to correlate the onset of illness with time and location of carpet installation. And with the exception of some air handling system studies, research efforts were focused almost entirely on how to go on using the carpeting. Experts on risk control <clears throat> who were union officers, including myself, were systematically excluded from task force decision making. We were told by EPA management that there was absolutely nothing that obligated management even to consider our advice. The agency stated policy in a letter to Senator Mitchell who inquired about the problem was to conduct research on ways to air out the carpeting so that installation could be resumed. It was obvious to us that EPA was determined to minimize the seriousness of the situation and ignore union efforts to contribute to the solution. It also became obvious to us that us career staff people would have to uh, grasp the problem on the local level and on the national level in our own hands and develop a, a plan for dealing with it. Union attempts to acquire information that we needed to develop that plan and make it work were stonewalled by EPA management. Uh, uh, we complained to the Federal Labor Relations Authority about that and in fact I believe it was just today that the uh, FLRA has issued a complaint against EPA for that behavior. The uh, plan that the union developed <clears throat> includes the use of the Toxic Substance Control Act to collect information, conduct testing, and to control the risk. It also includes cooperative efforts among government agencies, affected industry groups, public interest organizations, and private citizens. The latter, by the way, uh, seem to hold a tremendous database on the, on the scope of this problem, much greater than the government database on this problem. Um, and I'll talk to you, or I'll respond to questions on that uh, later if you like. Uh, let me say also that not all union dealings with EPA management have been as unsatisfactory as those uh, that we've had with the Office of Administration who had responsibility in this situation. We went very early on to the director of the Office of Toxic Substances and recommended a uh, review of the chief suspect chemical for phenylcyclohexane be done by the structure activity team, which you heard referred to uh, by an earlier panel and to recommend that the agency get on with a, an exposure evaluation of this chemical. What other products may it uh, be found in and, and how many people might be exposed? And uh, to OTS's credit, uh, that program has, has, has gotten underway. We are disturbed, however, by the lack of follow-up on the SAT's report. When a, new, when a new chemical comes into the SAT and receives the, the level of concern that 4-phenylcyclohexene received, normally what happens is that chemical goes into detailed review. If the detailed review sustains the findings of the SAT or the suspicions of the SAT of a toxic uh, effect, then that chemical is banned from production or uh, severe restrictions are placed on its exposure until testing is completed on that new chemical. To our uh, knowledge, nothing like that has been applied to 4PC. So this is one of the risk control criteria which seems to have slipped through the cracks in this particular problem. <coughs> Excuse me. The 4PC is the uh, chief suspect agent in this uh, situation. Um, it meets the criteria for strength of association with expression of disease and exposure to the chemical that are laid out in EPA's uh, interim guidelines for inhalational reference doses. It's an, uninten un an unintentional byproduct of the manufacture of a particular carpet component. Uh, the union doesn't believe that all carpets are toxic. Uh, our plan, in fact, is predicated on investigating the involvement of certain process controls on the uh, inadvertent overproduction of this byproduct and the resultant toxicity that may be expressed in people exposed to it. We think this is a TOSCA reachable problem. We think it is. We think especially by the use of the CARE rule that um, we can determine levels of 4PC in carpet and components, determine the level of uh, the extent of complaints that may be related to exposure to this chemical to mandate privately funded testing under section four and to determine if any testing has already been done and ultimately to apply controls. As for EPA's continuing insistence on leaving a source of toxic air pollution in, in the place at headquarters, uh, we're sorry to say that that seems to be the case. We hope the, that these hearings will, will prompt EPA risk management people to move in the right direction. The criteria that we'd like to see um, 
applied are those that are used to set, uh, if you will, acceptable exposure levels for toxic air pollutants. Those criteria call for the uh, application of uncertainty factors to doses of agents seen to cause toxic effects. We've seen if toxic effects in our people at EPA at air levels of 4 PC at 5 parts per billion or lower. And as a matter of fact, we've had two secretaries go down with the carpet illness last week at EPA headquarters in rooms where the, where the 4 PC levels were 1 part per billion. When we apply these risk criteria to the situation at EPA, uh, we uh, find that the, that the, quote, acceptable number ought to be somewhere well below a tenth of a part per billion. The best evidence that we have available now is that the levels are not going to ever get anywhere close to that based on the poor ventilation and the continuing source of 4PC, which is the large amount of carpet that still remains in place down there. Since the situation became national news, uh, the union's gotten a lot of phone calls, uh, letters from people around the country relating enormous uh, horror stories about uh, lives turned inside out from exposure to uh, carpet or glue. All these contacts that the union's been able to investigate so far seem to implicate 4-phenyl cyclohexene. The glue in these cases seems to be a styrene butadiene latex, which is similar to the one used in carpet backing. It's a shame that uh, it's taken this incident at EPA headquarters to bring uh, the, uh, this terrible situation to national attention, but here it is. And the question is now, what will EPA management do with its task authority to bring these risks under control? Let me assure you that the union of EPA professionals will continue through the perfection of its attack on this problem, through its plan of attack on this problem, and through keeping the matter before the public. We'll continue to do our duty to the public and to our brothers and sisters at Waterside. I'd also like to comment on what Eric Ruman said here before, which is uh, workers are often the guinea pigs in a toxic uh, situation in the workplace, and that's what we're getting. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Mr. Hersey, your testimony is enlightening. You know, here we have an agency, EPA, known as the Environmental Protection Agency, and it appears they can't even protect the environment in their own building. Uh, I don't know why we would expect that they could do anything throughout the country if they can't even do it within their own building. Let me ask you about that, because that is obviously uh, speaks volumes about the problem that we're here to address today. We, what do you know about the toxics? toxicity of the carpets at this point? I mean, what, what kind of information has been gathered? The, um, there has been some air monitoring done to show what levels of 4PC have been involved. Uh, there were some very preliminary studies done by the researchers at the uh, University of Arizona who discovered 4PC to be the essence of new carpet as they, as they uh, classified it. Those early toxicity studies were of marginal value. But most importantly, what we've seen now is the development of data on the species of question. We see exposure to the emanations from this carpet causing illness in people. When you look at the strength, strength of association criteria laid out in this reference dose document I, I mentioned before, you, you see a, a whole suite of, of uh, um, conformance between those criteria and the 4PC. In, the, in other words, the rate of development of illness was highest when the carpet was first put in. Uh, we see a relationship between exposure to 4PC in carpet and also 4PC in glue, as uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of data from California have shown us. The SAT poses a plausible biological and structural mechanism for the expression of at least one set of the, of the toxic effects, namely neurotoxicity, by structural analogy with another chemical that's very close to, to 4PC. Uh, we've also seen, as I said, uh, these reports from the outside which indicate that s chemical sensitization takes place with this uh, chemical. We've seen that in EPA, we've seen it outside. Uh, this looks like a very nasty chemical indeed, and I think but testing... with respect to this individual carpet, there's still a lot of unknown, even though yes. we have these problems that clearly exist. Have you all received complaints from the public? who've been in EPA? Yes, indeed. We've, we've, we've gotten a lot of uh, letters and phone calls. As I mentioned before, I've spoken with one woman, for instance, uh, actually the, she's a wife and a family out in Cincinnati uh, who had this problem develop. They're involved in a lawsuit now against a carpet manufacturer. Mm -hmm. They were able to obtain from CPSC something like 75 or 76 reports. These people on their own, private citizens, developed 125 
complaints simply by putting advertisements in newspapers, uh, soliciting comments on people who've had problems with carpet and fumes in their own homes. I think based on, on this information, there are, probably, there are certainly hundreds and probably thousands of incidents like this that have occurred across the nation. We've really got to get after it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned the comprehensive health survey. What are you really talking about when you say comprehensive health survey? What would it entail? We'd like to see, a, a really would like to see a first class epidemiological study done at EPA headquarters. Uh, we have seen a, a whole suite of, of symptoms expressed in our workers uh, that range from those associated with sensitization, watery eyes, itchy skin, uh, to neurotoxicity, uh, dizziness, no, uh, uh, inability to concentrate, confusion. And we've also had reports in one work unit of 100% of the women in one of the work units having experienced reproductive difficulties, complete cessation of the menstrual cycle. It just stops. One of the women in that group had a spontaneous abortion. So it, it looks like there may be a whole set of toxic uh, effects that may be going on here, and we need to have a comprehensive study to find out what that range of symptoms is, at what exposure levels that occurred, and possibly the involvement of uh, biochemical factors in individuals. Uh, the, the point is, one of, the, one of the calls we got from a woman who works for NIH, uh, she indicated that she knows that she is deficient in a certain enzyme that metabolizes hydrocarbons. Uh, she mentioned to us that when she went into her apartment house that had been newly carpeted, uh, it was all she could do to get into her apartment and close the door before she fainted. And she believes that it's this deficiency in this particular enzyme that may be related to the neurotoxic effects. I think that's something that has to be investigated. This comprehensive survey really needs to, to really is the start of a, uh, of a major investigation of the toxicity of this chemical. Well, this question might be better for EPA, but uh, you seem so knowledgeable, and I'm uh, trying to get as close to this situation as I possibly can. Uh, the structure activity team, how is that constituted? I mean, who makes up that? They are scientists from the Office of Toxic Substances who have uh, extensive backgrounds in toxicology. Uh, when a new chemical comes before them in the pre-manufacture notification program, they take a look at the structure of that chemical, apply their professional judgment uh, as to whether or not that chemical is likely to cause a problem. If they raise a level of concern of moderate or high, it goes into detailed review, and then a, another, uh, a more detailed literature search is done, and if that literature search then sustains the concern of the SAT, uh, then certain restrictions are placed on that new chemical, as I mentioned before. All right. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Hersey. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hersey. We do appreciate it, because I think your insight, particularly being there in the building where EPA is managed, uh, is very insightful. Our final panel this morning is uh, EPA itself. We're glad to welcome Mr. Charles L. Elkins, the director of the Office of Toxic Substances. He's accompanied this morning by Mr. Joseph J. Miranda, Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Toxic Substances, both at EPA. Gentlemen, do either one of you have any objection to being sworn in? No. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do you? Welcome. As with the previous witnesses, your entire testimony will be made part of the record. And at this time, uh, we look forward to your comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you may have uh, noted from my um, uh, written testimony, uh, a week from tomorrow is the 12-year uh, anniversary of the Toxic Substances Control Act. Twelve years is a very long time. Certainly this act, uh, TSCA, is probably uh, is among the oldest uh, statutes that EPA is administering, and oversight hearings on a statute like that uh, are appropriate to see how it is, in fact, working. Within EPA, TSCA is administered by the Office of Toxic Substances, 
uh, OTS, and the Office of Compliance Monitoring, OCM. Uh, OCM does the enforcement with the help of small staffs in each of the 10 regional offices. I'm the director of the Office of Toxic Substances. I came to this job almost exactly two years ago. In one of my earlier incarnations in the agency, I had helped to negotiate TSCA with the Congress back in the 1970s, and it helped set up the Office of Toxic Substances. Uh, through the years, I had uh, been impressed by the quality of the staff that was uh, implementing uh, TSCA, but uh, was disappointed that the program had not fulfilled all of our earlier dreams. Uh, I didn't know why. I knew it was not for lack of trying because I knew many of the people in the Office of Toxic Substances, and I knew it was a complicated matter. I felt that I might be able to help based on my 20 years of environmental experience and eight other jobs in EPA. So I asked to be given the directorship of the Office of Toxic Substances and the EPA management agreed. Since I've been there, I've gotten a better understanding of the successes of the program and some of the problems. I've been trying to diagnose what the situation is, where the improvements can be made, and I've begun to make uh, those improvements. My written testimony, Mr. Chairman, lays out much of what I have found, but let me summarize it uh, here for you now. Uh, first of all, with regard to the new chemical program, clearly this was the most revolutionary part of the act uh, in 1976. We had all lived through the problems of PCBs, phosphates, and detergents, which caused eutrophications of our nation's lakes, and no one wanted another case where a new chemical would be introduced into our environment without prior question. The emphasis was on prevention, and that goal makes even more sense today. I think you only have to think about the Superfund legislation to realize that prevention is a lot cheaper than cleanup. After examining uh, the performance of the program in the, in the new chemical program, I've concluded that this new chemical program is a large success, and that this success is one of the best kept secrets in this town. It's ironic, but uh, this program will probably become famous if and only if we make a big mistake. Uh, almost 12,000 pre-manufacturing notifications have come through EPA's door, and OTS's staff have developed a chemical review system uh, which involves uh, structure uh, uh, analysis, which you've heard about th this morning, which is doing a good job in identifying the chemicals of concern and acting on them. In addition, I believe the program has gradually brought about a significant change in how the chemical industry does business, such things as safer processes and operations, research and development of safer chemicals. Of course, there are problems, as in any program. The most obvious one, which you've heard about this morning, is the statute has us doing all of this uh, without much data. 50% uh, of the pre-manufacturing notifications have no toxicity data associated with them at all. The ones that do have data it's mostly acute data and not chronic data, data on chronic effects. Uh, the result of this lack of data means that the new chemical review is a sophisticated scientific detective job. Quite frankly, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack at night without a flashlight. But I'm confident that the Office of Toxic Substances has developed uh, the best staff in the world for making these scientifically sound decisions in the absence of these data on new chemicals. Turning then to the collection of information, uh, another major piece of the statute. Uh, every day, uh, my colleagues in other EPA programs and in other health regulatory programs sit down to make risk reduction decisions and are confronted with major data gaps. And yet the public interest demands that those decisions be made despite those data gaps. I guess it's an occupational hazard that environmental health regulatory People like ourselves uh, uh, have, this, uh, have to make these decisions without data. If you can't deal with uncertainty, you certainly don't ask for a job in decision making in EPA. Of course, millions of potential data gaps exist, but not all of them are really crucial to the decision making on risk reduction. But basic toxicity and exposure information is very important. And other environmental laws, as you know, do not make much allowance for planning ahead to get these gaps filled before the data are needed. The vision behind the provisions of TSCA was that these data gaps would be filled at industry expense and that the new data would guide future risk reduction decision making. Section 8 of the law provides for industry to provide the data it already has 
and Section 4 provides for industries generating certain additional data. In the testimony that I provide the committee, I have laid out the relative success of Section 8 uh, of, the, of the Act. We have collected a great deal of information, and now it is uh, available to, to everyone, uh, in most cases with very little uh, confidential business information restrictions. There are exceptions, of course. The Section 4 program uh, has had some very high startup costs, as I lay out in the testimony. I won't repeat all that here, but I will say that the program is moving faster now. In the past three years, we've published 32 proposals and 38 final test rules, and I see the opportunity for a number of additional improvements on the horizon. However, I would be less than candid if I assured you that we will now cause to be generated anywhere near the amount of test data which my colleagues in EPA need, much less what we need for decision making under TOSCA. In short, our vision in 1976 was much bigger than the program that we have created, uh, but this should not distract from the quality, detract from the quality of the work which has been accomplished and much more work is forthcoming. Let me turn finally to the existing chemical program the objective of the TOSCA existing chemical program uh, is to identify new chemical hazards and then intervene to prevent or reduce those hazards which no other federal program can. This objective was important in 1976, but it's even more important now in 1988. You're aware, Mr. Chairman, that most of the laws which my colleagues and EPA uh, implement deal with either catching the pollutant as it comes to the end of the pipe, installing uh, control technology there and hoping that not too much actually reaches the environment, or in the case of the Superfund program and the correct corrective action, the RICRA, cleaning up the problems that have been created that have uh, not been caught by that technology or by people's behavior. Prevention of these problems makes more sense now than ever before through control of toxic chemical use, if necessary, from cradle uh, to grave. I mentioned the way the TOSCA lays this out is to have us identify those chemical hazards and then intervene. I think the program has done a credible job down through the years in identifying many of the hazards, but it's well known that the program has had a poor performance on the intervention side of the equation. Some of these problems are inherent in the task and the tools which Congress gave us in 1976, but some of the program problems are susceptible to management control. We've tried to identify these and we've started to fix them. I provided to your staff a copy of a report that is uh, in draft, uh, which uh, identifies uh, what we believe to be the management problems in the existing chemical program. And uh, we're in the process of finalizing that and getting it uh, implemented. Uh, so although I can confidently promise better performance in the intervention arena in the future, I doubt that it will ever meet the high expectations of those of us who created the original vision and helped write the act. So in summary, I believe the Toxic Substances Control Act is a critical component of our nation's environmental and public health laws, and we have a very skilled and dedicated staff to carry it out. In fact, it's probably the most highly educated staff in the entire agency. I believe the new chemical program has been highly successful in carrying out the kind of preventative program envisioned by Congress. Our information gathering efforts under Section 8 have been extensively and effectively used to support TOSCA and other programs. The testing program has survived its birth and adolescence and is in the process of maturing into a mainline program for EPA and other agencies in providing the tox data needed to support uh, decision making. The existing chemical program has not yet made this transition. It is clearly the most difficult of the pro programs to make work successfully. We've identified a number of problems of implementation, and we've tried to distinguish between those we can fix and those we can't, and on those we can, we are trying to fix them. It's our hope to continue to bring the level and quality of all our inputs under this statute closer to the vision that led to the enactment of this law in the first place. Many of us have chosen to work in this program, Mr. Chairman, because it is, in our view, the most challenging program to implement in all of EPA. It may give us gray hairs, but we think it's worth the effort. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Elkins. And at this time, I recognize Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Section 4F of TSCA provides that the administrator 
must initiate appropriate action under Section 5, 6, or 7 within 180 days after receipt of test data or other information which indicates that there may be a reasonable basis to conclude that a chemical substance or mixture presents or will present a significant risk of serious or widespread harm to human beings from cancer, genes, mutations, or birth defects. This, session took, this section took effect in 1979. When was the last time EPA published a designation of a chemical as a Section 4F chemical? That was in 1985, I believe, with methylene chloride. Right. I ask unanimous consent that the notice designating Section 4F chemical be included in the record. There are only four. The National Toxicology Program has identified a great many substances known to the carcinogenic and to which a significant number of persons residing in the United States may be exposed. And I would like to enter this in the record, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> you receive dozens of Section 80 notices each year reporting information which reasonably supports the conclusion that a substance present, a substantial risk of injury to health of the environment I'd also like to enter this in the record as well, and let the record reflect. Frankly, I find it hard to believe that with, with all of the, those possibilities, for three and a half years, EPA has found no more chemicals that meet the requirement of Section 4F. Can you explain why? Mr. Towns, the uh, agency has laid out a policy for implementing Section 4F of, of the statute. Uh, one of the major uh, parts of that policy is that the information, the, the data, must be new. Uh, that is, that occurring and being made available to the agency for the first time after 1979, the date in which this uh, portion of the act uh, went into effect. Uh, many of the health effects which we are notified of uh, under uh, various sections of the act, such as 8E, uh, in fact, uh, uh, does, do not give us uh, insight into new effects that were not known prior to 1979. Uh, therefore, a number of the decisions by the agency in implementing 4F have been based on the, on the principle that the statute required 4F to be implemented in those cases where it was new information, uh, a new health effect uh, coming to the attention of the agency. Secondly, the agency has interpreted 4F to require uh, that uh, we have both information on toxicity as well as some basis of just of uh, estimating exposure, either monitoring data or knowledge of the chemical properties which will allow us to extrapolate what those uh, exposure factors uh, would be. And these have been weighed as these 4F decisions um, have been made. Well, let me ask this question then. Congress requires EPA to issue an annual report each year. Among other things, you are to make recommendations for legislative change. To my knowledge, you've never made a recommendation for a change in 4F. Why not? Uh, as I indicated, Mr. Towns, I have uh, been in this job for only two years, but I uh, not sure what kind of recommendation you would make that we should, uh, um, with regard to changing 4F, uh, for instance, are you suggesting that, that uh, we should not require uh, information on both the toxicology and the exposure of these chemicals before we declare it to be a 4F? I think what we're chairman. interested in, you just say that there's no new information. Are you to have us believe that no new information has been available in the two years or that you've been there? Certainly not. What I was saying, Mr. Chairman, was that the agency has essentially three criteria that it, that it has uh, applied to 4F. Number one, that the health effect has to be a health effect of the chemical which we did not know about in 1979. Well, no, let me two. let me let me okay. specifically ask you about that. If you have a suspect carcinogenic, uh, carcinogen, uh, which is discovered to now be a confirmed one, 
Is that not new information? My, my understanding of the agency's policy that has been applied in earlier decisions on this is that that, that would not be interpreted to be new information. Are you kidding me? That's not new information? Mr. Elkins, you're not going to make Marin that. Let me, Mr. Miranda, let me, uh, that's not the argument of the agency, is it? Let me ask Mr. Miranda, to, who has uh, had more experience in these 4F decisions, to clarify. Perhaps I've misspoken. Yes, I believe that uh, the specific example you cite, uh, Mr. Steinar, where the information previously available indicated only a suspicion of the effect and the data which now become available confirm that effect, uh, we would indeed consider to be new information, uh, whether it be under Section 4F uh, or under the, uh, the Section 8E, as cited under Mr. Towns. I'm sorry, Mr. Towns, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think you, you dealt with that. Um, I asked unanimous consent that two memos regarding PCEs be included in the record among other things, PCEs are used as substitutes for PCBs in the electrical equipment. Congress banned further use of PCBs in the 1976 TSCA statute because they were found to cause cancer. EPA has evidence since before 1979 that PCEs are also carcinogenic. However, in 1985, New data from the National Toxicology Program led to a change in the classification of the chemical to probable human carcinogen. OTS staff thought the change in classification was enough to require priority, attention, and that would be consistent with previous decisions. However, Assistant Administrator John Moore said that he did not consider the new evidence enough to merit 4F status. PCE is a solvent, which is used chiefly in dry cleaning, right? Is that correct? That's, That's correct. correct. Mm -hmm. And PCEs are released during sewage treatment, placing workers and people who live in the vicinity of the sewage treatment plant at risk for inhalation exposure. Is that correct? I personally don't have any knowledge of that. The major um, exposure to people to uh, PCE is uh, around uh, dry cleaners and inside uh, dry cleaning establishments, my understanding is, sir. How about you, Mr. Miranda? I would agree with Mr. Elkins that the analyses EPA has done uh, show that the, the principal exposure would be associated with dry cleaning. PCE is a widely used industrial and consumer product solvent, uh, and so there certainly are many opportunities for exposure to it. The one you describe is, is certainly a plausible one, but I'm not aware of specific data on that point. We certainly could check that if you would like us to. I'd like very much to get that information. And in 1985, didn't an, uh, an uh, a, uh, analysis of data obtained on human adipose or fatty tissue indicate that 52% of the resident population of the United States have detectable levels of PCE in their tissues? We certainly have conducted the, uh, the program that you refer to, Mr. Towns, which is the uh, National Human Adipose Tissue Survey. We don't, do not have with us the specific findings of that study as to the, the levels found, but we can certainly confirm that uh, or comment on it for the record. We can confirm that for you. That's exactly what we found. Go ahead, Mr. By the way, the National Academy of Sciences has been examining the question of the continued need for the Adipus survey. Has NAS finished its work? No, it has not. Their preliminary report is due in the spring, but they are anticipating uh, perhaps a two-year study. And PCE was one of the chemicals which reportedly appeared in drinking water wells in Woburn, Massachusetts. Was it not, you remember W.R. Grace was sued by eight families whose children had experienced childhood leukemia. Grace settled out of court in October 1987 and pled guilty 
to false statements to EPA in May of this year. Is that correct? That is not a program that we have responsibility over, so we cannot speak to that of our personal knowledge. But it, if I may interrupt. Are you not in charge of PCE as a toxic I'm substance? Not in charge of the Superfund program, sir. No, but I mean, are you not in charge of PCE? No, in sir. In charge of the Toxic Substances Control Act. Is PCE not under the jurisdiction of the Toxic Substances Act? It certainly is, yes, sir. Okay. And the question I think Mr. Towns asked you, was this not the substance that Grace had to settle with those people with respect to childhood leukemia? So you asked me to swear that I would tell the truth. I do not personally have that in my own knowledge. Ms. Miranda, can you, you know? answer that? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I cannot. Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with the specifics of the, the case in Woburn. Uh, I believe there were a number of solvents that were found there, uh, and whether it was PCE perchloroethylene or TCE trichloroethylene or other solvents, uh, no, I don't have that knowledge. Well, uh, do me a favor, when you get back, check your records, because we got that information from your records. Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, since EPA believes that PCE does not qualify as a chemical that presents or will present a significant risk of serious or widespread harm, could you explain what chemicals will? I'm going to put into the record EPA's current 4F guidelines, which are many pages long. I would like for you to explain in simple terms what chemicals EPA believes deserves 4F attention, if any. Mr. Towns, let me begin by saying the agency is acting on PCE. Uh, we do think it is a significant risk and the agency should regulate uh, PCE. Uh, so I want to set the record correct uh, on that. You asked uh, specifically whether this was a 4F chemical. That is a different uh, uh, question and you uh, provided us a copy of the guidelines which we uh, do follow in the Office of Toxic Substances in deciding whether something is a, uh, a 4F uh, chemical. The decision in this particular case was made by John Moore uh, in the memo which you uh, passed out, which is January 24th, 1986, in which he determined that the factor that, uh, if I may quote, the factor weighing heavily in my deliberation was the newness of the data. Uh, he felt that the information was already available to the agency uh, at the, in 19, before 1979, and he therefore did not believe that the uh, information uh, invoked uh, Section 4F. Uh, however, Mr. Towns, you should know that we have proceeded to examine the exposure of people to, to PCE. We uh, met with the administrator last year on this subject having done extensive analysis of uh, PCE. Uh, we have uh, uh, recommended to the administrator that a uh, uh, NESHAP uh, standard, that is a, a standard for hazardous air pollutant under the uh, AIR Act be promulgated uh, to control uh, the uh, emissions of this um, chemical, thereby controlling most of the um, uh, serious uh, exposure and uh, effects of this chemical, so that uh, that that action uh, uh, will be forthcoming from the air program um, uh, as a result of that decision by the administrator. So I want to assure you that the agency has not um, put aside PCE as a major hazard. Uh, we have uh, proceeded to make some decisions on in that regard. Which one that of the things that you just went through have you made a final decision on? The decision has been made by the administrator that we would issue a NESHAPs for PCEs in the uh, dry cleaning industry. Uh, that rule is now being developed by the AIR program. That's not a final decision. That is, is not it? a final decision. The answer in the is zero, isn't it, Mr. Elkin? That's correct. Thank you. Let me just ask, does the agency have any responsibility in determining cancer risk to workers uh, how can we be assured that this responsibility won't be balanced between you and OSHA? Someone has to take responsibility for protecting the American workers. And that's just not clear to me. Mr. Towns, we do a great deal of work uh, in protection, the, protecting the workers of this uh, country, more so than I think we're given credit for. Most of the decisions made in the new chemical program are, in fact, worker uh, protection uh, uh, decisions, and they are being protected through our 
uh, decisions on a daily basis from the exposure to new chemicals. Uh, with regard to existing chemicals, however, which is, I think, the, the focus of your uh, question, we are bound by Section 9 of this Act uh, to provide the opportunity to OSHA to regulate these chemicals, and only if they choose not to do we have the authority um, to um, um, act and if they decide not to because they do not think there is a risk, we still do not have any authority to act. Uh, so we are bound when we have something that is a, a serious occupational hazard to uh, refer that under the Act uh, to OSHA. In this particular case, I'm happy to inform you that uh, OSHA um, has in rulemaking a lowering of the uh, permissible exposure level for PERC. Uh, which, in our judgment, based on the analysis that we've done of dry cleaning, will have a major impact on the exposure uh, and the risk to the workers in um, uh, these dry cleaning establishments. It will not uh, uh, eliminate it, but it will uh, substantially uh, reduce it. You know, I want to make certain that I'm fair. You indicated that uh, you're doing more than you're getting credit for. for. In the new chemical area, yes, yeah. sir. Why do you think you're, you're not getting credit for it? Well, because I mean, most of it is secret, sir. Um, the, um, the act requires... It's a big secret. It's a secret because the act requires us not to reveal confidential business information and almost all the... Uh, I appreciate how you did that with a straight face. <laughs> 5% of the PMNs have no confidential inf uh, business information uh, associated with them. Uh, that leaves us a 95% uh, load in which uh, we are not allowed to uh, make this information available to the public. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Elkins. I, uh, I must admit that uh, uh, I'm extremely concerned, and I think that when you look at what's going on in the workplace and the feelings that they have, I think that uh, you need to take a very serious look at where you are. And I think that certain things need to be done and need to be done right away to reassure the workforce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Mr. Elkins, let's get into some specifics here. And uh, let's talk about the status of chemicals uh, uh, which EPA has identified as, quote, being deserving priority under Section 4F, if we could. Now, six years ago, this subcommittee uh, held a hearing regarding EPA's decision-making uh, on formaldehyde. Finally, uh, EPA, uh, if I recall our history right, made a 4F determination on May 23, 1984. Uh, but as we heard earlier uh, from the witnesses that have been before us, uh, EPA has not made a final decision regarding formaldehyde. Now, you, you will agree that formaldehyde is one of the sources of indoor air pollution uh, that's used in paneling, floor covering others, won't you, Mr. Elkin? That's correct, sir. Now, you will agree that these products which uh, formaldehyde is used on can be treated to significantly reduce the effects of formaldehyde. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, sir, I missed They can the... be treated to reduce the effects? By putting coatings on, for instance, this sort of thing? Some, in some cases. Uh, our information on that is that uh, the coatings are put on, on them. We do not have good measurement uh, uh, information to tell how effective they are. And intuitively, we do think that they are somewhat effective. All right. It's been four and a half years, four and a half years uh, since the 4F determination. Can you tell us today when EPA will make that decision with respect to the re regulatory action on formaldehyde? I would expect it to be very shortly, sir. We have made a decision uh, within the program office. We're in the position. We are in the process of uh, uh, taking that decision uh, upstairs uh, to the assistant administrator, and then on to the. Uh, What's very shortly mean, Mr. Elkins? Is that this fall? Is that next year? When, when's the decision? Give me a date here. Uh, as far as the assistant administrator, I would expect that to be in the next month or two. When will they have it out for, uh, for comment? For the final, I mean, final resolution. Uh, once the decision is made, we will have to, uh, one of the possible decisions is whether that under Section Nine, it must this decision must be referred to another agency first. Could it be four and a half more years, Mr. Elkins? 
That will be up to, I'm afraid, the other agencies, sir. So you're not giving us move. any hope today, are you? After four and a half years that we're coming to a final decision. I think as far as EPA is concerned, we will have come to a final decision. You want to go the, back? Okay, what date will the EPA make its final decision? Help us out here. Well, I can't speak for my superiors, but we will provide them the opportunity to make that decision within the next three or four months. Okay, let's get into format. I understand, I think you'll agree that people have different sensitivities to the substance, so let me ask you this. Tosca gives you all at EPA the authority to require labeling, and by rule, uh, you can do that immediately if you find that it's necessary. Why haven't you all required labeling as a temporary measure so that people uh, could make their own choices so while you look into what has now become a very lengthy and detailed analysis? Uh, most, it, that is a possibility, Mr. Chairman, but... Uh, Not a possibility. Why haven't you done it before now? It's been four and a half years. Uh, in, in analyzing that uh, particular option, Mr. Chairman, it did not uh, appear to uh, go to the, the heart of the problem, which is that much of the exposure is in, first of all, uh, manufactured. I mean, you housing. understand where we're going here. You've been four and a half years in the decision process. You can't give us a time certain today. As an in, interim measure, you could do labeling, and now you're telling us you haven't even thought of that as a solution. No, we did think of it, sir, and it was examined by the administrator. He decided not to do it because he did not see that that was the, uh, went to the heart of the matter, would, that would in fact reduce uh, most of the, uh, the problem that uh, we had examined. Okay, uh, let me ask you about 4F chemicals. Uh, they are supposed to get priority. How many full-time equivalent employees have been devoted to this formaldehyde issue? How many full-time equivalent employees at EPA have been given this area? Sorry, sir, I don't know. We can provide that for the record. Our record shows four. If you could confirm that or right. correct that, we would appreciate it. Now, on January 5, 1984, Mr. Elkins, EPA identified 1,3-butadine as a 4F chemical. There are three billion pounds uh, being produced each year. It is a cancer-causing uh, uh, agent uh, that's in both rats and mice. Now, the Science Advisory Board, uh, Mr. Elkins, has concluded that there's sufficient evidence to consider uh, this as a probable cancer-causing uh, agent to humans. Now, EPA was concerned uh, that workers were receiving exposures at the same uh, route as the mice studies. What has EPA done about uh, one three butadiene? Butadiene. We dying? have okay. dying. Yes. We have uh, uh, first of all issued a notice of um, uh, an A and an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, and then we, under Section Nine A, referred this matter. To OSHA as we felt when did we you refer that to OSHA, obligated. Mr. Elkins? Uh, in October 1985. Since then, has OSHA made any changes in the workplace standard? No, but they did what the Act calls for them to do, which was to uh, indicate that they agreed with the risk and that they wouldn't uh, initiate action. Uh, they are now informing us that they expect to issue a rule uh, within the next uh, four to six months. Mm -hmm. That's after they announced their proposed rulemaking in October of 86, isn't it? That's when, in, in um, yes, that's correct. When do you expect final action, Mr. Elkins, on that? They've informed us informally four to six uh, months. Okay, has EPA made a, a listing decision? A listing decision, sir? Mm -hmm. on the, under the Clean Air Act? Under the Clean Air Act for this as a toxic uh, air pollutant? I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know. Um, all right, on May 14, 1985, EPA announced a Section 4F priority listing for methylene chloride. The review was undertaken because, let me quote now, under EPA's interim cancer guidelines, methylene chloride should be considered a probable human carcinogen. And it is, quote, a solvent that is widely used in industry and in certain consumer products, unquote. In addition, large populations are exposed to lower concentrations of methylene chloride in the ambient air from industrial complex sources. What is the status of methylene chloride, Mr. Elkins? 
Mr. Chairman, the administrator decided the way to proceed on methylene chloride was to uh, look at it, at it in conjunction with, with five other uh, chlorinated solvents, the reason being that these solvents uh, can be substituted for each other, and he felt that uh, uh, it was inappropriate to uh, make decisions on individual chemicals and perhaps move people from one chemical, one carcinogen to another carcinogen. Uh, we therefore have had a chlorinated solvents project which has looked at, instead of individual chemicals, uh, particular use categories. In the case of methylene chloride, uh, one of the major uses is uh, degreasing of metal parts. Uh, that the analysis uh, by the staff is complete on that matter. It is being taken, in fact, tomorrow to the uh, committee of 15 office directors, uh, which um, decides whether or not this is ready for a uh, decision by the administrator. I That's expect. awfully timely, isn't it? It's been scheduled for about three or four months, sir. Okay. Uh, in fact, we're late by a month or two. Uh, the, uh, the decision then will be whether or not uh, um, it should be ready, it was ready for option selection by the administrator, and in fact, uh, I expect it to be so, because I believe the staff work is, is ready for that. We'll see what my fellow office directors believe, and if so, we will take it to the administrator. Okay, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the tables from the 1987 EPA publication be admitted to the record. Now these uh, report the results of testing of products purchased in different kinds of stores throughout the country. Mr. Elkins, as you can see, methylene chloride was found in a large variety of those products in that sheet that we have before you. So last week, we in the subcommittee went shopping to see just what was on the market, and the first thing we found was hairspray. Kathy's just handed me, and the label says on here, it has methylene chloride and says, quote, intentional misuse by deliberately concentrating and inhaling the context can be harmful and fatal, unquote. Then we had a couple of products that appear to be the same ones under the test survey here. This one says, let me quote, use with adequate, use with adequate ventilation, avoid prolonged breathing of sprayed mist or vapor or, or contact with skin and eye. So it is clear from the label that it also contains methylene chloride. It's not clear, I'm sorry, it's not clear. It's not clear that this has got that in it. Now the other product I have here lists uh, methylene chloride and says, let me read it here, avoid prolonged contact with skin and breathing vapor or spray mist contact with eyes or uh, skin. And it says also use only with adequate ventilation. Now, fortunately, uh, however, it looks like health labeling is beginning to make a difference. And the final product I have here is, is one for strip P. And it has, and let me quote again on the back of this one, methylene chloride has been shown to cause cancer in certain laboratory animals. Risk to your health depends upon the level and the duration of exposure. Reports have associated repeated and prolonged occupational exposure to solvents with permanent brain and nervous system damage. I think our point is, uh, Mr. Elkins, uh, that while the regulatory agencies are uh, deciding what to do, just from these products which I've shown you here, people are being exposed and in many cases have absolutely no idea what the problems are. Uh, why can't uh, you all down at EPA respond more quickly to this stuff? Well, on those products that you're talking about, most of them are aerosols. They will be, the staff work is almost complete on that, and uh, will follow the same route that I just described. Is that going to be the standard place. answer for this whole hearing? Almost there, going to get there, probability there? I hope not, near sir. Near future here? But, but I think uh, one also has to recognize that the the act in which we are operating under does require us to collect uh, a considerable amount of data for decision making in EPA. How much more decision making? Let me, give me the strip piece again. How much more do you need? It's clear that this warning tells you what you need to know. It's clear from these that the, the manufacturers, these products see the potential human danger there clear enough. What more do you need, Mr. Elkin? How well, long is it gonna take? As I indicated to you, the administrator was concerned that if we banned one of these 
six uh, solvents, we would in fact drive consumers or users, in the case of manufacturers, uh, industries, for instance, uh, uh, cleaners, to uh, uh, go from one carcinogen to another, and that uh, if in, under any act, uh, Tosca was one where one should consider uh, the total uh, set of solvents for which, which are substitutable. We have here two other ones, and these are the ones with the alternatives that you're talking about. What are you going to do now? On, on some alternative solvents, mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to tell me what they are, but I, they may well cause cancer as well. Do they say That's so? That's correct. What it may mean, sir, is that if there is no... Well, let, uh, me, let me interrupt you. Let me ask unanimous consent at this point to put into the record portions of the EPA tracking system. Now, it identifies, Mr. Elkins, three other chemicals which have, to varying degrees of impact, uh, part of the integrated solvents that we've been talking about here. And as I pointed out with these other products, they contain substances uh, that are contain, they contain those substances and they're going to uh, be used as alternatives, possibly cancer causing, and there's no notice. There is no communication, no labeling uh, with respect to their potential danger. You know, uh, what is the likelihood, Mr. Elkins, that as consumers start reading the health warnings of methylene chloride, manufacturers will turn to other solvents? I think there is some good possibility of that. Uh, as they do that, they have to be careful because uh, uh, some of the other solvents, as I indicated, are not safe either. And when will you be making decisions about those solvents, Mr. Elkins? I expect that to be uh, early next year. Okay, Mr. Pounds. Thank you, Chairman. The chemical advisories, you know, really have no real effect. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that chemical advisories issued by OTS be included in the record. Will you explain what these are? Chemical advisory is in a is a communication to users of a particular chemical targeted to uh, the people that we think are using it and are exposed to a chemical to identify to them uh, potential uh, risk. Uh, in some cases, it, it uh, is an appropriate mechanism to get the word out quickly uh, to users so that they can uh, have the benefit of our information uh, uh, prior to rulemaking. In other cases, uh, uh, we feel that that uh, is an appropriate uh, full response to the particular hazard uh, that we've identified. Let's look at the one issued for TDAs. The advisory says they are considered by EPA to be a possible human carcinogen and to minimize exposure and workers should wear protective clothing. And if there is a high potential for exposure, workers should use an appropriate full face pressure demand supplied air respirator. Are these advisories enforceable by EPA or anyone else? They're not enforceable by EPA. They are enforceable in one sense, if you allow me to put quotes around that, uh, under the hazarded uh, communication uh, program of OSHA in the sense that uh, people who distribute these chemicals and uh, make them available to their workers must make available this information. Uh, to their workers. Uh, um, you know if that's been done? In this particular case, uh, no, I don't think we've done a study so of that. So for all practical purposes, there is no, no one. There is what? I'm sorry. There is no one enforcing that, is there? Uh, OSHA is in charge of enforcing that. I didn't say that. that. But in this well, case, they, there's they, no they, one. Is there, Mr. Elkin? Uh, sir, you put me in a difficult position in the sense that I do not have uh, knowledge of the extent to which OSHA is enforcing the Hazard Communication uh, Act. Well, let's put it, has EPA ever done a survey to find out whether the intended user, users actually receive these and whether there is effective compliance? Is it, let's put it that way. Mr. Cowan, you're referring specifically to our chemical advisories issued at EPA? Yes, that's correct. No, we have, have not done a, a formal survey of the individual substances on which we have issued advisories. The agency within uh, 
the last year did an overall survey of various types of risk communication activities, but it did not explore in detail the response to the individual advisories. In 1980, the Interagency Testing Committee, which makes recommendations for priority testing, recommended TDAs for testing. Can you tell us what EPA did after that? Yes, Mr. Towns. Uh, uh, the, the TDAs were uh, recommended by the Interagency Testing Committee, I believe, as part of a broader category of chemicals uh, uh, known as the phenylene diamines. EPA, uh, uh, in response to the Interagency Testing Committee's recommendation, initiated the rulemaking process under Section 4 with the issuance of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. EPA also uh, carried out its routine collection of data using the authority of Section 8A of TSCA on the production and exposure levels of the compounds and the submission of existing data, health and safety studies under Section 8D. After reviewing that information, EPA found that there already was adequate information in EPA's view to confirm that the two major forms of TDA, the 2,4 and the 2,6, isomers of TDA had already been tested for carcinogenicity and found to be carcinogens. It was as a result of that evaluation that EPA decided to issue the chemical advisory, which you referred to earlier, and also to refer to OSHA for their further action, any control of the workplace exposures to these TDAs. EPA retains the TDAs in its test rule evaluation process, however, with respect to the possible environmental effects of the, of the compounds. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that a May 1984 memo be included in the record, which states that further testing for health effects would not be necessary if control measures were initiated based on the data of the carcinogenicity. Now, EPA informally referred TDAs to OSHA on July the 10th, 1986, am I correct? And issued an advisory on September 1986. What regulatory action has OSHA taken since then? I think this was one of our three formal uh, referrals to uh, OSHA. This was an informal referral. I think uh, we can referral. conclude in none. I think that's a safe assumption. Another advisory for used motor oil is addressed primarily to workers. Have it because of concerns that millions of consumers who change their own oil would not see it, consideration was also given to a labeling rule. Did EPA adopt a labeling rule? You're watching a hearing of the House Environment and Public Works Subcommittee. It's focusing on the Toxic Waste Control Act. We now leave this program to fulfill our commitment to bringing you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the House of Representatives. Tune into our program update at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific, for information on when this program will re-air on our overnight schedule.